Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. As the trio of P-51 Mustangs approached the object, it was clear that whatever they saw was at an altitude of at least 30,000 feet, placing it way above the capabilities of the Mustang's design. Both of Thomas Mantle's wingmen broke off pursuit at around 22,500 feet and began to head back to the base. Mantell ignored all orders and encouragement to return with the rest of his squadron. As experienced a pilot as Mantell was, it seemed inconceivable that he would make a basic and fundamental error of judgment such as this. High altitudes like that drastically increase the likelihood of hypoxia. Something other than a high-altitude weather balloon compelled Mantell to continue his pursuit. Perhaps it was the planet Venus. However, it was not something that anyone could possibly see in the middle of the day anywhere in the world. Being as patriotic as the next man, Thomas Mantell almost certainly considered this to be of a significant threat to America. Thus, it was his sworn duty to protect his country. It is reasonable to assume that at some point during his pursuit, Mantell began to feel overcome with the effects of hypoxia and maybe even spatial orientation and passed out before he could counter those effects. Unable to correct his flight path, the Mustang headed higher and higher before the engine eventually became starved of oxygen as well. The Mustang probably continued on until gravity took hold of it and made its pilot the first recognized victim of the UFO age. I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… Most of us would say it's difficult to understand how someone who was responsible for deliberately killing hundreds of people could be elevated to the status of a hero. However, those who speak in favor of Julia DeFauna say her motives and actions were justified. Can an ambulance be haunted? One story I'll share with you might convince you it is. What led Captain Thomas Mantle on a chase to his death? Does something evil reside in the Hollywood Forever Cemetery in Los Angeles? The U.S. Civil War was the bloodiest of all American wars, despite it was America fighting against America. But aside from the bloodshed, broken bones, and corpses that littered the battlefields, something even more horrifying was taking place in one particular POW camp holding Union prisoners. Barbara Forrest and Mary Ashford lived in different centuries, but they died in chillingly similar ways. Is it possible that Bill Ramsey is, in fact, a real-life werewolf? But first, during the last 300 years, at least 200 cases of spontaneous human combustion have been registered around the world. What is causing this to happen? And can it be stopped? We'll begin with that story. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, to enter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the Weird Darkness.
Spontaneous Human Combustion, or SHC, is a well-known but unexplained phenomenon when the human body bursts into flames without any external source of flammable ignition. During the last 300 years, at least 200 cases of SHC have been registered around the world, but it's not exactly correct. The SHC phenomenon was mentioned much earlier, for example, by a Roman poet and philosopher, Titus Lucretius Carus, who lived from 98 to 55 BC. Throughout history, many more cases of spontaneous human combustion could have occurred, but they have never been officially recorded. A very popular and long-existing theory says that the victims of spontaneous combustion fires drank lots of alcohol, which, as a flammable liquid, could cause the combustion process. But how do we explain SHC victims who never were heavy drinkers? Other theories blame obesity, increased body weight caused by excessive accumulation of fat, static electricity, and divine intervention. On April 4, 1731, the Countess of Cessna, Italy was found burnt to death on the floor of her bedroom. All that was left of the Countess's body were her stockinged legs and the rest of her head. Also, greasy soot was again found like in other similar cases. Many other spontaneous human combustion incidents inspired Charles Dickens, the great English novelist, who described the phenomenon in his novel Bleak House. Almost immediately, he was attacked by critics who considered SHC acts as incapable of occurring and rather an irrational belief. Dickens, who carefully researched the phenomenon based on about 30 cases, could easily defend himself. There is a certain pattern in all spontaneous human combustion incidents, no matter whether the case is old or modern. Police and fire experts usually find burned corpses except for the extremities and no burned furniture. Also, the alcoholism theory seems to be insufficient to explain all mysterious cases. One minute they may be relaxing in a chair, the next they erupt into a fireball. Jets of blue fire shoot from their bodies like flames from a blowtorch and within half an hour they are reduced to a pile of ash. Typically, the legs remain unscathed, sticking out grotesquely from the smoking cinders. Nearby objects, a pile of newspapers on the armrest, for example, are untouched, according to a Cambridge professor, Brian J. Ford. Professor Ford is a research biologist and author of more than 30 books, most about cell biology and microscopy, but he has turned his attention to the mechanisms behind why people would explode. The most recent SHC case was that of an Irish coroner, 76-year-old Michael Faherty, who died on December 22, 2010. West Galloway coroner Siren McLaughlin recorded the cause of death as spontaneous human combustion. This is the first reported case of SHC in Ireland's history. The fire had been confined to the sitting room, the BBC reported, the only damage was to the body, which was totally burnt, the ceiling above him and the floor underneath him. No accelerant was found, nor any signs of foul play. Professor Ford wanted to disprove the alcoholism theory along with the so-called wick effect suggested by London coroner Gavin Thurston in 1961. Thurston had described how human fat burns at about 250 C, but if melted, it will combust on a wick such as clothes or other material, at room temperatures. I felt it was time to test the realities, so we marinated pork abdominal tissue in ethanol for a week. Even when cloaked in gauze moistened with alcohol, it would not burn. Alcohol is not normally present in our tissues, but there is one flammable constituent in the body that can greatly increase the concentration. The body creates acetone, which is highly flammable. A range of conditions can produce ketosis, in which acetone is formed, including alcoholism, fat-free dieting, diabetes, and even teething, Ford explained. So we marinated pork tissue in acetone rather than ethanol. This was used to make scale models of humans, which we clothed and set alight. They burned to ash within half an hour. For the first time, 
a feasible cause of human combustion has been experimentally demonstrated. Does that solve the issue? Does that answer the questions? Not all of them. We'll let you decide. I spent my entire career working for a small fire department in northern Nevada. In 1998, we worked 24-hour shifts, so we slept at the station. Over the years, many people passed in the back of our ambulance, and there were lots of little sounds or things where they shouldn't be. But this is the strangest thing that happened. While finishing chores one night, I walked around one of the ambulances to ensure that it was ready to go. It was a quiet night with no calls. The next morning, an angry firefighter stopped me to complain that the reserve ambulance looked like a dump. I laughed, knowing he was joking, as I had ensured its readiness not 12 hours prior. When I asked him to show me what I had missed, he opened the rear doors, and I stood there in utter shock and confusion. The gurney and floor around it was trashed, littered with bandage wrappers, open IV packaging, and other medical supplies. It looked like we had just run a full code. Even the defibrillator was on. My first thought was that I had somehow slept through an incident, but that couldn't be since there were only two of us on duty at the time. My partner had already left, so I cleaned everything up and went home. When I told him the story later, he didn't believe me and was sure I was messing with him. When the other guys corroborated the story, he was still skeptical. This was in 1998. To this day, I never figured out what happened that night. That was, without a doubt, the strangest thing I ever experienced at work. Barely six months after the Roswell incident and barely a week into the brand new year of 1948, one of the most sinister of all UFO encounters took place a stone's throw from Fort Knox in Kentucky, the Thomas Mantell UFO incident. It was lunchtime when several witnesses on the ground reported an object often described as large, circular, and metallic, measuring approximately 300 feet in diameter to Kentucky State Police. From certain vantage points, it was described as moving in a westerly direction. Godman Airfield was contacted, and within half an hour, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base confirmed that they had no aerial traffic in the area. Sergeant Quinton Blackwell and Base Commander Colonel Guy Hicks were two of the three witnesses in the Godman Air Traffic Control Tower that also saw this object, as well as watching this unknown object change colors from red to white Hicks said he saw an umbrella-shaped craft that appeared to be a quarter the size of a full moon. Four P-51 Mustangs were en route to Standiford Airfield when they were asked to investigate the sighting. The airborne squadron were under the command of Captain Thomas Mantell. Even though the 25-year-old managed to secure his status as pilot in the middle of the Second World War, he was already an experienced pilot with the newly formed Kentucky Air National Guard having logged over 2,000 hours of flight time. Alongside him were a pair of wingmen. On his right was Lt. Albert Clements, and on his left was B. A. Hammond. Clements was the only pilot of the three that was equipped with oxygen. The fourth pilot was not able to pursue an investigation as his Mustang was low on fuel. He returned to base, while the other three continued onwards and upwards. As the trio approached the object, it was clear that whatever they saw was at an altitude of at least 30,000 feet, placing it way above the capabilities of the Mustang's design. Both of Mantell's wingmen broke off pursuit at around 22,500 feet and began to head back to the base. Mantell ignored all orders and encouragement to return with the rest of his squadron. As experienced a pilot as Mantell was, it seemed inconceivable 
that he would make a basic and fundamental error of judgment such as this. High altitudes like that drastically increase the likelihood of hypoxia. Something other than a high-altitude weather balloon compelled Mantell to continue his pursuit. Perhaps it was the planet Venus. However, it was not something that anyone could possibly see in the middle of the day anywhere in the world. Being as patriotic as the next man, Thomas Mantell almost certainly considered this to be of a significant threat to America. Thus, it was his sworn duty to protect his country. It is reasonable to assume that at some point during his pursuit, Mantell began to feel overcome with the effects of hypoxia and maybe even spatial orientation, and passed out before he could counter those effects. Unable to correct his flight path, the Mustang headed higher and higher before the engine eventually became starved of oxygen too. The Mustang probably continued on until gravity took hold of it and made its pilot the first recognized victim of the UFO age. The watch that Mantell wore stopped at 3.18 p.m., and investigators took this to be the moment of impact. Ever since the wreckage was discovered close to the border between Kentucky and Tennessee, just outside a local farm near Franklin, the belief surrounding what happened has been documented between the official account and the unofficial. Project Sign was the forerunner of Blue Book, and it was concluded that Thomas Mantell became embroiled in a top-secret mission known as Operation Skyhook. They speculated perhaps he pushed both himself and his aircraft beyond endurance chasing a Project Balloon, of which he would not have had any foreknowledge. The official findings either didn't know about or chose to disregard the many eyewitness accounts of the Mustang's final moments in the air. Glenn Mays was one of those that saw the Mustang in the air. He said that the plane circled three times and gave him the impression that the pilot wasn't aware what the plane was actually doing. Then there was an explosion. The wife of Joe Phillips, owner of the farm close to the plane's final resting place, also reported hearing an explosion. Even though she was indoors at the time, she also said she heard the engine. In her opinion, it was not working as it should. The most damning testimony came from the USAF's own investigator, Captain James Dusler. Speaking from his retirement home in England during 1997, he revealed the scene he saw at the site of the crash. The Mustang came down in a wooded area and none of the surrounding trees showed any sign of damage. Dusler reckoned that the wreckage was placed there and did not crash. Both wings had broken off, as had the tail section. Each lay a short distance from the fuselage. The fuselage was undamaged and intact. One of the propeller blades was embedded in the ground, but oddly it didn't show any damage consistent with operation when it came into contact with the ground. As a former air crash investigator, Dusler knew what to look for and what it meant. He didn't believe that the propeller blades were not in use when the crash occurred. The crash site is not the only peculiarity to this fatal incident. Mantell was determined to chase down this object, but he kept in radio contact during the pursuit. Mantell had no idea what he was looking at, but did describe what he saw. He reported back that this metallic object was massive and that sunlight may have been reflecting off of it. The Thomas Mantell UFO was traveling at half the speed he was, but the craft always remained ahead of him and above his position. In the operations room of Scott Air Force Base in Belleville, Illinois, Richard Miller was monitoring the communications. He claims that he heard Mantell refer to occupants. He also added that the morning after, intelligence officers from Wright-Patterson turned up and demanded that they hand over all materials on the crash. Miller, like all other personnel, had little choice but to comply. However, he insisted that the officers admitted that they had already completed the investigation. Many ufologists consider the Thomas Mantell UFO incident to be one of the more significant cases on record. The official cause of the crash may be what actually happened, but it is conjecture. Theorists have proposed other causes over the years. Speculation about a deliberate hostile act to shoot down the Mustang emerged. Other people talked about an encounter with a force field or an electromagnetic pulse. Perhaps what Richard Miller heard is true 
and the USAF are just not telling. Murder by beings unknown or a tragic accident? What exactly was the Thomas Mantell UFO? No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee – fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. As the snow blustered outside, he pulled his woolen coat over his shoulders and prepared himself to trudge out into the brisk cold of the moonlit darkness. He didn't prepare a lamp as the bright light of the moon was adequate for the journey. A long journey, though it would be. He shoved the letter into his pocket and placed his hand on it to assure himself it was still there, feeling the words written on it inside touching his heart. As he pushed the door open on its creaky hinges against the snow built up outside, he placed one foot in front of the other with his head bent down. The cold air and wind bristled past his ears, and he began his journey. There was no trodden path, so each footstep was new. The snow crunched before him as he looked over his shoulder. He realized that he was indeed alone on this forlorn night. Farther and farther as he made his way into the forest, he saw the shadows of the naked trees as if they were aboding shadowing ghosts looming over him. With his hand in his pocket, all he could think of was his precious E. Through their correspondence, E was the only name she gave him, and G was the only name he gave in return. The letter felt good in his hand and gave him warmth, warmth inside if nothing else. He wished he had a horse, but he didn't have one, so every footfall were just tiny steps toward his destination. It's so cold, he thought, and I have so far to go. I must get there before daylight. The moon was waning. I really needed to hurry. She told me to get there before daylight, before her father came home from a business trip. This was the time, you see, the time she told me in the letter to meet her. As I clutched the letter in my hand in my pocket, I began to walk faster. I still had a few mountaintops to cross, but just a few more miles. Finally, I came to a path that led up a hill that leveled off, and I was amazed as it opened up into a clearing with a majestic castle in front of me. This I could see clearly as the moonlit shone on the white stone facade. I was nervous now. I slowly made my way up to the double doorways and crept up the steps till I made my way to the giant door knockers. Should I use them? No, I chose not to. I walked my way around until I saw a coal chute. I was amazed that things seemed to be recently cared for. I weighed my options knowing that I wasn't supposed to be there. I chose the coal chute. I lifted the heavy metal lid and eased my way down into the dark, dirty abyss. As I slid my way to the bottom and found my way to the mound of coal at the bottom, I realized I had nowhere to go but up. I tried to dust myself off, but that was impossible. I was cold and dirty and black. I looked forward and saw some stairs, narrow, dark, and dirty. I climbed the stairs until I came to a door that entered into the lower floor. As I opened the door, I was amazed to see a grand room 
with a fire built in the fireplace and burning. The warmth and soft glow was so inviting. I wanted to lay down right there in front of the fireplace and warm my cold and weary bones, but I knew I had to go on. Across an expansive marble floor was a spiral staircase so inviting I could not resist. As the fire crackled, my head turned towards the stairs and my body seemed to glide towards them without even a second thought. Up the stairs I went. When I reached the top, I knew automatically which way to go. I felt a presence. She had drawn me there. I opened the door and entered the room. And there it was, a most beautiful mahogany coffin. I didn't know what to do. I crept my way towards it and stared for a moment, then tapped on the top. The sun was beginning to peak up just about that time, and just as I opened the lid, there she laid, pretty as could be. Suddenly, there was the sound of a herd of horses, and I closed the lid quickly and fled back down the stairs, back into the coal bin as her father came home, rushing to get to his daytime abode. That coal is black and cold. I laid on that pile until all the sounds went away. Hours I must have laid there. All I could think about was the letter that was in my pocket, my E. I clung to it the whole time, the only warmth I had. As the sun slowly began to rise, I peeked out the tiny opening of the coal chute and saw the dew begin to rise as the sun came up, making an early morning fog. In the distance were some apple trees. I was beginning to get hungry. Should I venture out and try to get a few? No. I remember, she said, only come by the light of the moon. It seemed like an eternity, and I fell asleep and laid there until the sun went down again. Once I heard the horses being bridled and hitched again, comfort came over me. I reached into my pocket to remember once again why I was here. E. That's why. And I remembered that she said, Gee, please come. Now, here I am. Why? Against every fiber in my being, why am I here? I am here because she beckons. Her father is an ominous man, worldly and intimidating. I know I should not be here. When I woke up, the sun was setting again, the light quickly drifting away. I climbed the stairs once again, past the fire that was still burning. Up the stairs and back to that box. There it was. I touched the lid. I tapped on it. Then I raised the lid. But E wasn't there. I felt in my pocket just to check for the letter to see if this was real. It was still there. Bats began to fly around my head. Bats? Are you kidding me? Where did these things come from? I swarped and swatted and tried to flail them away. In the midst of my preoccupation, I turned, and there she stood. The bats were suddenly gone, but there she stood in her glorious beauty. I was aghast, yet captivated. Never had I seen such a stunning creature, the epitome of beauty. Those teeth. Just as I knew she would, she embraced me and gently placed her fangs into my neck. Now I was complete. As I awoke the next morning, I looked outside the window, and hearing her father's horses upon their return, those apple trees had a whole new meaning to me. Most of us would say it's difficult to understand how someone who was responsible for deliberately killing hundreds of people could be elevated to the status of a hero. However, those who speak in favor of Gaia Tofana say her motives and actions were justified. Gaia Tofana, who lived from 1620 to 1659, poisoned 600 men, but she only targeted one specific group of men 
whom she believed had to die. Her famous poison, aqua tofana, named after her, was impossible to trace during an autopsy. Considering she is one of the deadliest female serial killers in history, it is surprising how little there is information about Gaia Tafana. There are no portraits of her and much about her past is unclear. Based on what is known, Gaia Tafana was born in Palermo around 1620. She had a daughter, but whether she was married or not has not been determined. The use of toxins and poisons in the Middle Ages and Renaissance was very common and there were those who made their living as professional poisoners. The most common poisons were cantrella, strychnine, hemlock, belladonna, foxglove, aqua tofana, and arsenic. Gaia Tofana's marketing idea was to sell poison to unhappy wives. In those days, when marriage was prearranged and there was no possibility of divorce, there were plenty of women who wanted to get rid of their husbands. Many complaining women came to Gaia telling horrible stories about poverty, abuse at home, and all kinds of cruel treatments. Gaia felt sorry for the women and wanted to help them get an early divorce by becoming widows. She started to sell cosmetics in southern Italy, and one of her most popular products was the poison Aqua Tofana that she disguised as a powdered makeup. Aqua Tofana was a mixture of arsenic, lead, and belladonna, all deadly poisonous substances. Whether she or her mother, Tofania di Adamo, came up with the recipe is unknown, but four drops of the substance were enough to kill any man. Although her plan was to sell the poison to low-status women, the fact remains that any woman could buy Aqua Tofana and the business was highly lucrative. Tofana's poison was tasteless, odorless, colorless, and sold hidden in small vials with the image of St. Nicholas of Bari. The small bottle could be placed on women's dressing tables next to other lotions and perfumes without raising suspicion from anyone. In the 1650s, one of Tofana's clients realized she was about to do something horrible. She had bought a bottle of Aqua Tofana and was prepared to poison her husband but at the last minute she stopped her husband from eating the soup. The suspicious man forced his wife to tell the truth, and papal authorities learned about Tafana's poison. Beautiful Tafana was very popular, and the public protected her from apprehension. She sought and was granted sanctuary in a church, but when rumors spread that she had poisoned the water around Rome, the police forced their way into the church and dragged Tafana in for questioning. During torture, Tafana confessed she had killed 600 men with her poisons in Rome between 1633 and 1651. In July 1659, Tafana was executed along with her daughter, Girolama Spira, who was also selling poisons, and three of her aides. After her death, her body was thrown over the wall of the church that had provided her with sanctuary. Aqua Tofana became so famous that in 1791, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart claimed that he was being poisoned with Gaia Tofana's invention. From his deathbed, Mozart declared, I feel definitely that I will not last much longer. I am sure that I have been poisoned. He went on to claim, Someone has given me Aqua Tofana and calculated the precise time of my death. There is no evidence that Mozart died by being poisoned with Aqua Tofana, but Gaia Tofana's deadly recipe was still being discussed over a hundred years after her death. Nothing goes better with chocolate than vanilla, and nothing goes better with the darkness than vampires. So we've combined all of them into a new blend of weird dark roast coffee called Very Vampilla. This bloody good blend combines a medium dark roast coffee with hints of chocolate, vanilla, and just a tad bit of dried cherry too. So good, you'll want to sink your fangs into the fresh roasted bag itself. 
Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla. The only thing at stake – sorry, not sorry, bad pun – is your dissatisfaction with your old coffee. Sip it while the sun is down if you're one of the undead, or when the sun is up if you just feel dead and need a bit of a boost. Get your Weird Dark Roast Berry Vampilla at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. In 1863, Confederate General John H. Winder sent his son, Captain W. Sidney Winder, to scout out a location for a new prison in Georgia. He discovered what he believed was the perfect site around November 24th. The parcel of land was located deep in the heart of the Confederacy and was far removed from attack. It was also a site where food would be abundant. Confederate officials planned a new prison on the property to be called Camp Sumter. It would contain a number of barracks which were designed to hold between eight and 10,000 men. The site Captain Winder chose was in southwestern Georgia along Station No. 8 of the Georgia Southwestern Railroad. Because of this, it would be easily accessible by train. A local resident named Benjamin Dykes who owned a sawmill and gristmill offered a parcel of land for the prison which was extremely convenient for Dykes since the Army would be forced to buy his wood and grain for the prison construction and for food for the prisoners. The piece of land was heavily wooded with pine and oak, and the ground sloped down on both sides of a wide stream. Orders were given from Richmond to start construction, but the local people were violently opposed to the prison being located so close to them, so much so that labor was impossible to find. Work was delayed for some time before, finally, soldiers were forced to commandeer slaves from nearby farms. Just as construction of the prison compound was getting started, conditions in the South made it impossible to build barracks for the prisoners. Rail lines and distribution centers were greatly stressed by the war, so, out of desperation, the government ordered that a simple stockade be erected around the compound as quickly as possible. This work began in January. Trees were felled and then stood on end to form a large fence around the camp, enclosing an area of just over 16 acres. Only two trees were left standing inside the compound itself. On February 25, 1864, the first 600 prisoners arrived from Libby Prison in Richmond. One wall of the stockade was still not completed when they arrived. Confederate artillery pieces were trained on the opening until the wall was completed. Just shortly before the prisoners' arrival, the camp's first commander, Colonel Alexander W. Persons, took over his duties. He continued to serve until June 17th when he was replaced by General Winder. In March, the camp's most infamous commandant, Captain Henry Wurz arrived at Andersonville. Heinrich Hartmann Wurz was born in Zurich, Switzerland in 1822. He graduated from college in Zurich and then went on to medical school in Paris and at the University of Berlin, receiving two Doctor of Medicine degrees. In 1849, following the failed revolutions of 1848 in the German states, he emigrated to the United States and settled in Kentucky where he married and established a medical practice. When the Civil War began, Wurz enlisted as a private in the Louisiana Volunteers. At the Battle of Seven Pines in May 1862, he was badly wounded and lost the use of his right arm. The Army found work for him, though, promoting him and placing him at prisons in Alabama and then in Richmond. Eventually, he was assigned to the staff of General Winder the man in charge of Confederate prison camps and ended up at the village of Andersonville in Sumter County, Georgia. From the very first, there was no organized arrangement for the compound. The prisoners had simply been put in the stockade and then left to themselves. Many of the prisoners who were transferred from other camps were in horrible condition when they arrived, infested with disease and vermin which quickly spread to the other men. The first arrivals at the camp had built huts within the compound using pieces of scrap lumber that had been left within the stockade. Later arrivals lived in tents or in holes they dug in the ground and covered over with blankets or scraps of cloth. 
In July 1864, the stockade was enlarged to accommodate more men, and within a week the camp's population had risen to 29,000. Less than a month later, it would rise again to its highest point of more than 33,000. Bizarrely, Andersonville technically became the fifth largest city in the Confederacy. As time progressed and the stockade became more crowded, food rations began to dwindle. The first staple to vanish was salt, followed by sweet potatoes, which had once been plentiful in the region. In time, the authorities reduced the amount of cornmeal handed out, and later meat was eliminated altogether. The rations continued to decrease, and soon they were not even handed out every day. On one occasion, when the bread wagon entered the stockade to make a delivery, it was mobbed by the inmates and all of the bread was stolen. Captain Wurz responded by canceling all further rations for the day. According to some prisoners, the more sadistic guards, usually those of the 55th Georgia, would toss chunks of cornbread into the pen just to watch the men scramble and fight over them. Many of the prisoners began to devise ways to capture low-flying birds, which swarmed about the stockade in the evenings. The swallows that were snared were often eaten raw, such was the hunger of the starving men. Security precautions at the prison camp became almost as legendary as the horrible conditions. The two regiments of Georgia and Alabama troops who guarded the camp were assisted by a battalion of cavalry and a large pack of savage bloodhounds. These dogs had been used before the war to track down runaway slaves, and they now were being used to bring back any escaped Federal prisoners. Despite the ferocity of the bloodhounds, there were still 329 successful escapes from Andersonville during the 15 months when the camp was in use. Most of them took place during work details, although the very first attempt occurred within a week of the camp's opening. A group of 15 men managed to scale the east wall using ropes made from woven pieces of cloth. All of them were recaptured thanks to the dogs, but the attempt caused the establishment of the deadline within the stockade. This deadline was a boundary that was erected inside the stockade walls, made by placing a rail of pine logs about 25 feet inside and parallel to the walls. Guards sitting in pigeon roosts located every 90 feet along the wall were ordered to fire without warning if a prisoner crossed or even touched the line. Soon, word got out in the northern press about the Andersonville deadline and it became infamous. The newspaper railed about the savagery of the southern prisoners and the barbaric design of the deadline. At war's end, it would even be publicly condemned by the Union government. The problem was that despite all of the public posturing, the federal condemnation of the deadline was sheer hypocrisy. All stockade-type prisons had some sort of deadline for security, including the federal ones. This fact was hidden from the American public until after the war when Confederate prisoners returned home. It is ironic that while the American press was fulminating against the deadline at Andersonville, Confederate prisoners were being shot for crossing the same sort of lines in places like Camp Hoffman, Rock Island, Camp Douglas, and other spots. Once the deadline was established, tunneling became the preferred method of escape. With the digging came many problems. Every tunnel required a huge amount of secrecy, and in a situation where thousands of men were packed into a stockade, privacy was hard to find, and, as with most prisons, Andersonville had its share of informants. In one well-known situation, in May 1864, the Commandant entered the camp with a squad of guards searching for escape tunnels. One prisoner, thinking that he might get special treatment for informing on his comrades, told the commander about a tunnel that was under construction. The Confederates punished the prisoners involved and forced them to fill in the escape route. That night, the informant was nearly beaten to death by other prisoners. He was pursued through the night and into the next morning, and finally he crossed over the deadline and called for protection from the guards. He was sure that he had earned it because of the assistance that he'd given them. Instead, they shot him for crossing the deadline. Soon, escapes grew more innovative. There were so many dead men being carried out of the camp that little attention was paid to them. 
When a prisoner died, he was placed in front of his tent and then carried away by a detail of other prisoners. Several quick-thinking men pretended to be dead and were carried outside the gate, then placed in a pile to await burial. As soon as darkness fell, they would escape. This plan was successful a number of times before Captain Wurz got wind of it and changed the burial policy. After that, all of the bodies were left inside the stockade until a surgeon could examine them. There were certainly many opportunities for escape using this method, since death was no stranger to the camp. The main causes of death were scurvy, dysentery, typhoid, smallpox, gangrene, and diarrhea, but outright murder became commonplace as well. In fact, the murder of prisoners by guards and even by other prisoners became a daily occurrence. Among the prisoners were groups of men referred to as raiders. These groups ruled the stockade using fear and retaliation against any who opposed them. They preyed on the other inmates, taking food and belongings from them and even beating and killing anyone who crossed them. The largest and most vicious of the raider groups was led by William Collins of the 88th Pennsylvania Regiment. His men dominated not only the other prisoners but the other raid as well, looting and murdering as they saw fit. Finally, a group of prisoners banded together and they somehow obtained aid from the Commandant. He allowed them to take matters into their own hands, and they arrested the raiders. A military trial was held and 24 of the raiders were punished, with six of them hanged. Three of the other 18 men later died from retaliatory beatings. In the years that have passed since the closing of Andersonville and the end of the war, the ghosts of the raiders have been blamed for most of the strange happenings in the area. This is perhaps merely legend, but many have claimed the raiders to be responsible for numerous weird events. The odd sights and sounds include apparitions of soldiers around the location of the former camp, the sounds of groans and echoing voices, and the sound of what seems to be a number of men tramping about the site of the former camp. By September 1864, the majority of the prisoners had been transferred out of Andersonville due to Union activity in the area and because of the northern occupation of Atlanta. In the weeks that followed, it was reported that as many as 6,000 were sent to other camps. Those who were too weak or sick to travel remained behind, leaving just over 8,000 men in the camp. A huge number of those prisoners died in October, so by November, just over 1,300 men were left. In October, General Winder was transferred out and Colonel George C. Gibbs arrived to assume command of Andersonville. From that point, the camp took the role of a convalescent prison. As soon as the prisoners gained enough strength to travel, they were transferred to other facilities for a short time. The remaining Andersonville prisoners were paroled in May 1865. It is believed that as many as 13,000 prisoners died during the time the camp was in operation. The last prisoner parolees brought an end to the history of the Civil War's most notorious prison camp or did it? To this day, the ghost of Henry Wurz is believed to haunt the site of Andersonville Prison. Legend has it that the ghost was also rumored to have haunted the old brick capital in Washington for a number of years, but apparently his spirit returned to the place of his greatest notoriety. Some believe that it may be Wurz's ghost that has been seen walking along the road near the site of the old camp, they believe that his spirit does not rest because of the terrible blot on his reputation that came about after the war. Captain Wurz always insisted that he was unjustly accused of crimes committed at Andersonville. He went to the gallows, claiming his innocence. But was he innocent? Wurz was never a popular officer, even before his arrival at Andersonville. He was disliked by nearly everyone, including his subordinates and his own staff. He was especially hated and ridiculed by the prisoners for his heavy accent and overbearing personality. In 1864, Wurz was sent to Andersonville as the Commandant and continued in service there until after Lee's surrender. At that time, he turned over the camp to Union General J. H. Wilson and ended his career in the Confederate military. 
A short time later, he was placed under arrest by Captain Henry E. Noyce and charged with misconduct against Union prisoners at Andersonville. Wurz protested the arrest, stating the conditions at the prison had been beyond his control. He begged his captors to allow him to leave and take his family to Europe. Instead, he was taken to Washington and officially charged with impairing the health and destroying the lives of prisoners. The arrest of Wurz was part of a much wider response to the American thirst for revenge against the Confederacy. It was believed that by arresting Wurz, the government might be able to placate the public. Whether Wurz was responsible for all of the horrors of the camp, though, was questionable. There was no question that terrible suffering took place at Andersonville and little doubt that Wurz was a harsh and possibly sadistic commander. However, Southern contemporary accounts insisted that he did the best job possible under extreme conditions. There was no question that Andersonville was the South's most impoverished and overcrowded prison. There are many today who believe that Wurz was nothing more than a scapegoat for the poor condition of the Confederate prisons and a victim of the post-war backlash against the South. The trial of Henry Wurz began in August of 1865, ending a three-and-a-half-month feeding frenzy by the press. While the former captain waited in jail, the Northern newspapers had already tried and convicted him many times over. He had been portrayed as a monster who maliciously sent scores of Union soldiers to their deaths. Attorneys for the federal government began their case against Wurz, presenting evidence in the form of records, documents, and testimony from former prisoners and from Union officers who had inspected the camp after its surrender. The witnesses were not always reliable, as several of them stated that they had seen Wurz strike, kick, and shoot prisoners in August 1864, during a time when the Commandant was absent from the camp on sick leave. Of all the testimony, perhaps the most damaging came from a man named Félix de la Bonne, who claimed to be the nephew of a Revolutionary War hero, General Lafayette. He spent several hours on the witness stand describing the defendant's cruel treatment of prisoners and his total disregard for the nightmarish conditions of the camp. Baum's testimony appeared in newspapers across the country, and in the end, it sealed Wurz's fate. Baum was rewarded for his testimony with a position in the Interior Department. After the trial, it was learned that he had been a deserter from the Union Army and was not descended from General Lafayette. On November 6, 1865, Wurz was condemned to death. Not long before his sentence was carried out, a secret emissary from the War Department offered him a reprieve in exchange for a statement that would convict Jefferson Davis of conspiracy to murder prisoners. Wurz refused. Henry Wurz was hanged in the yard of the Old Brick Capitol on November 10, 1865. He was the only Confederate officer to be convicted and executed for war crimes. He maintained his innocence and was defiant until the very end. As he said to the officer in charge of directing his hanging, I know what orders are, Major. I am being hung for obeying them. Was Captain Wurz ultimately responsible for the horrific conditions at Andersonville? Was he to blame for the deaths of thousands of Union soldiers? The question remains unanswered, but it seems that his spirit remains behind to try and restore his reputation. There is little doubt in the minds of witnesses that the apparition that they have seen pacing through the site of the former prison camp is that of the infamous prison commander. The officer in the neat gray uniform is, like worse, ruggedly handsome, with the short beard and the hat that the commander always wore. Often he wanders the grounds restless and looking inconsolable, shaking his head or talking silently yet wildly animated to himself. On other occasions he is seen standing in place, by the road or in the stockade area, a mute reminder of his possible innocence or perhaps he is merely sentenced to remain in this world as punishment for his crimes.
While I was in Los Angeles in October of 2003, beginning my celebrity grave hunting adventures at the famous Hollywood Forever Cemetery, I had a rather strange experience. As I was walking toward the Abbey of the Psalms Mausoleum, a feeling of dread came over me. I could think of no idea why I should feel so afraid, but as I got closer to it, the feeling grew. It got to the point where I was forcing myself to go forward. I don't know how far away from it I was when I finally stopped, but one thing was for sure – I could not continue and would not approach any further. In all the other parts of the cemetery, I felt nothing but peace among the stillness of the graves and tombs, but for some strange reason, the Abbey of the Psalms Mausoleum was different. At first, I couldn't figure out why, but then I felt that there was definitely something wrong about the place. I felt the need to try and get closer, and as I did, I felt the presence of something there, the presence of something that shouldn't have been there at all. A mausoleum is supposed to be part of a sacred grounds, but I felt nothing sacred about this place. My theory is that somehow a gate or door exists there, a gate or door to a place dark, cold, and foreboding, a place of evil. And I think that it is through this gateway or door that something enters our world, something that has no business being here. Do you keep a journal or diary? If not, maybe you should consider it. It's been shown that journaling can help you reduce stress, help relieve depression, builds self-confidence, it boosts your emotional intelligence, helps with achieving goals, inspires creativity, and more. In fact, my friend S. Anne Lanise has created a Weird Darkness-themed journal just for you, full of blank pages for you to use as a diary, make notes for class or office meetings, jot down ideas for that novel you want to write. Use it for keeping a mileage log if you travel for business, whatever you want. In fact, she has numerous styles of journals to choose from. Along with the Weird Darkness journal, there's one for dealing with grief, for teacher's notes, for medical residencies, keeping track of your meds or health routine, and several others. Journals make a great gift for others, but it's also a great gift for yourself and your own mental health. No matter what you might want a journal for, My friend Anne has it, and you can see all of her journals, including the one for Weird Darkness, on the Sponsors and Friends page at WeirdDarkness.com. Looking at the evidence of the two Erdington murders, a detective might easily conclude he was looking for just one killer. Both victims were young women, just 20 years old. Both women spent their last night dancing. Both women were killed on the same day of the year, May 27th. Both bodies were found in the same spot. And, most telling, the prime suspect in both cases was a man named Thornton. The only problem? The two murders occurred 157 years apart. Adding to this eerie coincidence, both Thorntons were acquitted, and so both murders remain still unsolved. On May 27, 1974, the body of Barbara Forrest, a nurse at a children's home, was found in a ditch on the edge of Pipe Hayes Park in Erdington, a ward of Birmingham, England she had been raped and strangled. Suspicion fell on one of her co-workers, Michael Ian Thornton, who lived nearby. Blood was found on his pants, and his alibi for the night Barbara disappeared turned out to be false, but this was a decade before DNA was used as evidence. The case against Thornton was entirely circumstantial, and he was acquitted. Though tragic, this story would never have attracted so much attention if it weren't for the fact that it was an almost identical repeat of another murder that happened in the very same place 157 years earlier. On May 27, 1817, 
the body of Mary Ashford was found in a muddy pool in what would later be Pipe Hayes Park. There were footsteps belonging to a man in the mud. Mary's arms were bruised and authorities suspected she had been raped before she was killed. Like Barbara, Mary had spent her last night dancing. Among the men she was seen dancing with was Abraham Thornton, who was arrested. Thornton admitted to having sex with Ashford after the dance but insisted it was consensual and that he did not kill her. It was determined that Ashford died of drowning. Popular opinion was strongly against Thornton at the trial, but, as in the case 157 years later, there was no direct physical evidence, and Ashford was acquitted of both murder and rape. Ashford's brother demanded a new trial, convinced that Thornton was guilty. Thanks to the old style of law at the time, his request was granted, but Thornton pulled out an even older bit of law dating back to the Middle Ages. He demanded a trial by battle. At that time, the law was still on the books and, amazingly, the judge allowed it. If Thornton lost the battle, he would be hanged, but if he won, he would be acquitted. Ashford's brother declined the battle and, once again, Thornton went free. Despite being cleared of blame, public opinion remained heavily against Thornton. Eventually, after quite some time of intense ostracization, Thornton fled to America to begin a new life. The strange similarities between the Erdington murders continue to haunt locals to this day. Many who believe that the connection between the cases is more than coincidence will cite the two victims' words just before their slaying. Mary Ashford told a friend's mother that she had some bad feelings about the week to come. Barbara Forrest told a co-worker that she believed this is going to be my unlucky month, I just know it. The girl's predictions would both come eerily true within days. Andy Warhol once said that, in the future, everybody will be world-famous for 15 minutes. This is certainly true of an unassuming carpenter, Bill Ramsey. Born and bred in the Essex seaside town of Southend, the first inkling of trouble came when William Ramsey was just nine years old. Like any normal child, he was outside in his back garden when he began to feel strange. It was deep into one Saturday afternoon in 1952 when an icy blast of frigid cold swept all over him. Perspiration froze on his skin, and a foul stench came close to making him vomit. The bewildered youngster only had two things on his mind – running away to a life on the ocean wave and wolves. By this time, he was close to the garden fence, and only the calls of his mother brought him out of whatever had gripped him. However, something else took complete control of him instead. Intense and pure rage had installed itself firmly within his psyche. Using this and the adrenaline-fueled strength he now possessed, he had uprooted a fence post, with the fence still attached, and was swinging it like a club. Not even his parents could easily remove the post with their bare hands. What the young child did next made both of his parents flee back into the relative safety of their home, leaving Bill isolated outside. Bill Ramsey placed the wire meshing into his mouth and began gnawing at it. The cold sensations returned and a low growl emanated from deep within him. Both his parents remained inside the house until it was apparent that their son had calmed down considerably. For nearly 15 years after that terrifying incident, nothing even remotely similar happened in the life of Bill Ramsey. He had grown up, got married, and became a doting father of three. The first two years of his marriage, though, were plagued by nightmares. Each dream was the same, and the results ended up identical as well. Ramsey always awoke in a cold sweat and was overwhelmed by feelings of dread and unease. In his dream, he was always a few steps behind his wife 
who would then turn to face him and run away in extreme terror. It was only in 1967 that these dreams ended. Eighteen months on, and Bill woke up one night to hear what he thought was the panting of a wild animal somewhere inside the bedroom. He was correct. It was Bill himself. Once again, there was a lull in activity for approximately 15 years. It was now 1983 and Bill was out with some friends at a local pub. After several drinks, Bill began to feel the same icy chills that first manifested much earlier in his life. He made an excuse and headed to the lavatory. Once there, he checked himself in the mirror and saw a wolf looking back at him. This was just a precursor as to what was to happen on their way home. In the car ride home and without any warning, Bill began to growl and immediately turned to his fellow passenger. Both hands twisted into claws and Ramsey tried to bite the leg of his friend. The designated driver didn't panic. He brought the car to a stop and made attempts to get the raging Bill out of the back of the car. It still took several minutes and quite a bit of effort to finally get Bill out of the car. By now, the frenzy had dissipated. Worse was to come, but not for another 18 months. Shortly before Christmas 1983, Bill began to suffer from chest pains and thoughts immediately turned to a possible heart attack. Bill checked himself into the emergency room of the local hospital and was halfway through a blood pressure examination when he sank his teeth into the arm of the nurse and ran through the ward like a man possessed. Witnesses would later reveal that Bill had hunched shoulders and both hands had curled into talons or claws and his lips were bared just like a rabid animal. Anyone that dared approach was knocked down easily with almost superhuman strength. It took quite a few people working as a team to finally subdue the rampaging man. A police officer managed to place handcuffs around Ramsey's wrists, but still this was not sufficient. A tranquilizer finally put an end to the outburst. The following morning, this tranquilizer had worn off, and so did the original transformation. After a hearty breakfast, the attending doctor listened to the whole story and recommended that Bill remain under observation. However, he was a voluntary patient and was fully entitled to check himself out. Bill did so, but was back within the span of two months. In January 1984, Bill had just finished a visit to his mother when he began to feel an attack coming on again he made it to the same hospital on the same terms of his previous visit. The attending nurse was alone with Ramsey in the emergency room and feared for her life once she told Ramsey that she was going to find a doctor. Ramsey threw her to one side and lunged for an orderly. By chance, four police officers entered the hospital and immediately circled Ramsey. The officers and Ramsey had a standoff for a few seconds until Ramsey began snarling and growling at all four. The policemen advanced on Ramsey, who defended himself with some vigor. One of the four police officers suffered wounds so severe he ended up in the hospital for another four days. All four managed to handcuff Ramsey again. The short walk to the waiting squad car went off without incident, as Ramsey had apparently regained his faculties. When he arrived at the local police station, the police surgeon was immediately summoned. Ramsey considered the suggestion of checking himself into a mental institution, but decided against it, citing the stigma that he might feel in the days to follow. Since he was clearly in control and rational, Ramsey was released. In the summer of 1987, he was back at the police station. This time, however, he was much more public-spirited. Having made a citizen's arrest to a local teenage prostitute, he drove her to the station, The second that he parked his car, she fled into the station. Ramsey once again felt the now familiar sensations surging from the middle of his chest, just as a burly policeman approached the car. The officer, considerably bigger than Ramsey, started to question him and made the big mistake of gently touching Ramsey's arm. The wolf within him took immediate hold of Ramsey, and the officer was thrown to the ground and was having the life choked out of him until help finally came. Ramsey was so wild that it took a dozen policemen to hold him down and two injections to finally restrain him. For the next 10 days, countless MRIs, X-rays, 
and psychiatric tests could not determine what was wrong with Ramsey. Clearly, there was some issue that needed resolving. Nobody should really switch from mild-mannered rational to rampaging berserker and back again in the space of a few minutes, unless there is something seriously wrong. One thing that went in Bill's favor was the visit to London of American demonologists Ed and Lorraine Warren. Bill's story appeared on a television show at the time of their stay. Lorraine immediately considered that Bill was being possessed and got in touch with the South End on Sea police station. After dialogue on both sides, the Warrens were given the chance to talk to the Ramseys. The Warrens negotiated with Bill Ramsey and finally convinced him to come to their church in Connecticut and undergo an exorcism with their own specialist, Bishop Robert McKenna. Bill relented and made the trip with his wife in 1989. The tabloid newspaper, The People, sponsored the trip. The night before the exorcism was due to take place, Ramsey tried to strangle his wife while she slept. When the exorcism actually began, Bill was not at all impressed. The service was being conducted in Latin, and for half an hour nothing was happening. Bill then took on an entirely different appearance. His face contorted, and both hands formed claws. McKenna commanded the demon to leave. The full force of werewolf fury descended on McKenna one time and then disappeared for good. The whole event was recorded on film. So, has it finally ended? Bill Ramsey last appeared in public in 1992 when he updated his progress. Just before his exorcism, the transformations were increasing in both frequency and seriousness. Since that time, there have been no incidents recorded. No one has been rampaging uncontrollably through the streets of South End on Sea in almost 15 years now. But Bill Ramsey has been quiet for just as long as that before. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. She Poisoned 600 Men was written by Ellen Lloyd for Ancient Pages. The Unexplained Phenomenon of Spontaneous Human Combustion was posted at Message to Eagle. Ambulance Turmoil was posted on the Ghosts and Ghouls website. The Thomas Mantell UFO Encounter was written by Les Hewitt for Historic Mysteries. The fictional original story The Woman Known as E was written by George Boggs, dedicated to Ginny or Elvira Dark Six on YouTube. Hellhole of the Confederacy was written by an unknown author. Hollywood Forever is from YourGhostStories.com. The Eerie Similarities of the Erdington Murders is from TheLineup.com. And Bill Ramsey, the South End Werewolf, is from Paranorms.com. Again, you can find links to these stories in the show notes. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. Copyright Weird Darkness. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Ephesians 4, verse 29. Do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. And a final thought from Larry Burkett. Satan's number one weapon is pride. God's number one defense is humility. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Imagine waking up one morning and when you look at your friends or loved ones, you see their ears, noses, and mouths stretched back with deep grooves on their foreheads, cheeks, and chins. All the people you know have suddenly turned into hideous, demonic creatures, and it's not even remotely close to Halloween. That's what one Tennessee man is experiencing right now. I talk about him in this week's Mind of Marlar, which you can find at mindofmarlar.com.